It's Brett, and welcome to the first episode of this show called FNW Stories, where I will be your host. This show is going to be a little different than my previous series, History of FNW, as it's just going to be me going over one specific topic each episode, and they're going to be much shorter. These episodes also will just be going from topic to topic and not year to year, and I'm going to try and just go over new information that I didn't cover on History of FMW. Obviously, there's going to be times that certain information will need to be said again, but I'm going to try and keep that to a minimum to not sound like a rerun. Today's episode, we're going to go over the creation of FMW. Obviously, the creation of FMW starts with Asushi Onida. Asushi Onida was born on October 25, 1957, with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck, which Onida says that his difficult birth was the first of many times that he was going to be difficult to handle. Onida then remembers when he was five years old, when he was in the community pool, and he ended up pooping in it while swimming, which made everyone have to get out of the pool immediately, although Onida kept swimming in it after being told to get out of it, which shows that Onida is always going to do what he wants no matter what someone tells him to do. Onida's parents divorced when he was nine, and him and his mom moved from Nagasaki to Tokyo, and around the time he became a teenager, he wanted his independence, and he moved away from his mom, and began living on his own, doing small jobs just to be able to afford to live and buy food. During this time, he fell in love with American football, and he wanted to move to America and become an American football player, so he trained and trained as a teenager, before he ended up meeting a girl who was his first love. She would always go to the gym and so he would join her and go to the gym as well and there was a boxing ring there so Onida began boxing uh, while he was at the gym and he was really good at it. He didn't want to be a boxer though and that's all he was really doing and he eventually ended up losing his passion for being a pro football player because he was spending all his time in the boxing ring even though he didn't want to do it professionally. Eventually a friend ended up showing him a comic book with Giant Baba in it and suggested Onida try out for All Japan Pro Wrestling as they were accepting new students for the first time as All Japan Pro Wrestling had opened up in 1972 and this is about 1973 at this point. And Onita actually wasn't even that much of a fan of All Japan Pro Wrestling. He had grown up watching WWF. He liked Bruno San Martino, Pedro Morales, the Madison Square Garden matches. But he felt like he was kind of all out of options here, and this was something that he could do, and he did grow up as a fan. So he ended up calling All Japan over and over and over until they finally said, okay, fine, you can come to the now old sumo hall and try out for All Japan Pro Wrestling, which he did, and eventually after doing all the exercises was accepted and became the first student in the All Japan Pro Wrestling Dojo. Onita would work for All Japan starting in 1974 and eventually become their top junior heavyweight wrestler until April 1983 when he would end up slipping out of the ring while exiting it and end up tearing his ligaments in his knee as well as shattering his kneecap which would require knee surgery and he would end up being out of action for a year. Onita would come back a year later in May 1984 and actually his first tour back would end up accidentally breaking Bobby Heaton's neck. Onita would continue on in All Japan until December 1984, but he was having to take painkillers to get through the matches, and he just wasn't very good anymore. And Giant Baba, he didn't even want Onita to come back in the first place because of how bad of an injury this was. And Onita would give in to Baba's pressure and decide to retire in January 1985, with Baba giving Onita a going away pension. So Onita would end up getting a job selling cell phones and fax machines, and he did a lot of door-to-door -door selling, but one time he would end up going up to a guy who was trying to ignore Onita's sell pitch to him, and Onita would end up getting frustrated and yell at the guy to at least acknowledge his existence, and Onita would no longer be selling cell phones and fax machines after that. Then Onita would take a lot of his money that he had saved up and begin investing in condominiums and real estate, which would actually end up making him a lot of money. He would do really well with that. But after about two years, the economy would start to decline, and Onita would pull all his money out and use that to begin starting up bars, 
membership clubs, which are pretty much boy clubs where you go and you play roulette while girls dance on stage. And Onita loved Las Vegas, and he kind of wanted to replicate Las Vegas with his clubs. So he would end up having to pay a lot of money to start all this up, start all these different um, bars and clubs up, and they wouldn't do very well. And he would lose a lot of money really fast to the point where he only had $30,000 left in his account. And he was at a point, point where he was going to have to just move on, shut them all down, and go on with his life with the $30,000, or pay all his employees what they were owed and he would end up deciding to pay all his employees what they were owed before shutting all the clubs down and this would leave Onita with no money and he would end up having to just live off borrowing from friends going forward. So Onita would end up taking a job as a construction worker which he hated. He was really embarrassed from being a professional wrestler to now a construction worker and hoping that nobody would notice how far he had fallen. Then during one of his lunch breaks, his boss came up to him and said, you're a pro wrestler, right? With Onita going, yeah, why? And his boss said, well, someone from a Japan women's pro wrestling promotion called, and they want you to talk to them. So Onita got on the phone with them. He had never heard of this company before, but the owner had reached out to Onita, wanting him to become a coach and help train her girls for the promotion. Onita didn't care that it was a women's promotion, and he was just glad to be back in the pro wrestling ring. And eventually, Onita would end up wrestling his first match back since his retirement in the Japan Women's Pro Wrestling promotion as he would take on Gran Hamada, who also worked for this promotion. And you, back then, you didn't see men wrestle in a women's promotion. That match brought Onita's passion in pro wrestling back, and now he was back for good. He wanted to get back into the business full time. This would lead to Onita getting in with Grand Hamada's group, which consisted of Hamada, as well as the head of Pro Wrestling Weekly Gong, which was the number two wrestling magazine in Japan, uh, Kosuke Takeuchi, as well as Hisashi Shinma, who is best known for being WWF president in the 80s before Jack Tunney, but he had recently been working for the UWF promotion and he had parted ways with them after booking issues with Satoru Sayama and he had began working for the Japan Women's Pro Wrestling promotion along with Naoki Asuka who had been sales manager for New Japan while Shinmo had been working for them as well. And this group called themselves the Martial Arts Union and now Omnita was a part of this group. So this group does not like the UWF promotion, and they choose Onita as the new guy in the group to go to a UWF show in Osaka and deliver a note stating that the martial arts union was declaring war on UWF. And they paid Onita for his bullet train ticket to get to Osaka, but they didn't give Onita money to buy a ticket for the show. So when Onita got there, he was met by UWF president Shinji Kami, who goes, where's your ticket? And Onita's thinking, I'm a known wrestler, I shouldn't have to buy a ticket to go here to deliver a message that we're declaring war on you and Kami just goes to Onita you don't have a ticket you can't come in sorry and Onita ends up getting sent away and I think Shima did this with Onita on purpose as now Onita is pissed off at UWF and is all in on wanting to destroy them with these guys after they just messed with his ego so through Shinma, and because UWF isn't going to fight them, and they're looking to prove that pro wrestling is stronger than shoot style, the martial arts union would decide to get in touch with Masashi Ayagi's Saishin Kaiken group, which was a really big, uh, well-known karate school in Nagoya. And they would set up having a pro wrestler versus karate match, with Onita taking on Ayagi at Corrigan Hall during a martial arts event. So the fans coming to the show, they're all going to be karate fans, but this Onita stuff is already starting to pick up through being covered extensively in Pro Wrestling Gong magazine. And a whole bunch of wrestling fans end up showing up to this event and begin screaming back at the karate fans, letting their voice be heard. And Onita and Ayagi, they would have their match, and the fans being on separate sides would begin getting really passionately involved in this match, as Onita would eventually end up attacking Ayagi with a chair, which would result in the karate guys that were with Ayagi jumping in the ring and going after Onita, with Onita's guys coming in the ring as well, as the fans are about to start a riot they're so into this match. They would restart it, and Onita would then begin headbutting Ayagi, leaving him a bloody mess, before Onita would end up just knocking down the referee who was trying to stop him from headbutting Ayagi, with the karate guys running back in the ring, causing complete chaos, as this match was the start of everything. Onita then sees something here with how successful that match was and decides that he's going to start up his own wrestling promotion with the $500 that he has left as he sees it worthy of an investment knowing there's still money to be made with this Ayagi feud. 
The Martial Arts Union is also going to be on his side here as they have a working relationship with Wally Yamaguchi who worked for Gong as well and had a bunch of guys training downstairs in his wrestling shop which included Super Delphin, Jado, Ghetto, and Ultraman Robin. So they could help fill out the undercard for this promotion. Now the big question was what's this promotion going to be called? Onita would suggest the name PWA, Pacific Wrestling Alliance. And Gong's editor, Kosuke Takeuchi, would go, no, that's too close to All Japan's PWF title. People are going to get confused. And Takeuchi would end up suggesting the name Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling, FMW, with everyone agreeing that would be the name of the promotion. And Takeuchi is credited as being the godfather of FMW for coming up with that name. Oh, also a side note, Takauchi named the martial arts part in FMW because of their martial arts union group name. So the story goes that Onita started FMW up with only $500, and he might have simply just had $500 in his account at this point as he was pretty broke, but he actually borrowed money from friends so that he could start FMW. First he borrowed $1,300 from one friend so that he could rent an office for FMW for a place that to do all his business, and then he borrowed another $1,500 from a friend so that he could start FMW up officially. This was a big gamble though, starting up a small independent promotion, as the only other small independent promotion going was Pioneer Sinche at this time, and it wasn't exactly lighting the world on fire. So then a press conference would be then be set up to announce the creation of FMW, with Shinma booking it at the a a Hotel in Tokyo, which that's this nice fancy hotel that Shinma is a regular visitor at, and so that's why he booked it. And they invite the wrestling media members from the magazines and the newspapers to attend to get as much attention on this as possible. While well, Onita decides to get even more attention on this feud, he tells Ayagi that he wants Ayagi to attack him during this press conference, which Shinma and the other martial arts union members did not know about. So during this press conference, and this isn't videotaped, but Ayagi attacks Onita and they start this big riot at the hotel with Ayagi delivering a roundhouse kick to Onita and Onita ends up getting knocked out and he uses a blood capsule and begins to bleed from his mouth to sell the attack. Well, someone at the hotel sees Onita get knocked out, sees blood coming from his mouth, and believes this is real, like Onita really got knocked out. And so they call 119, which is the Japanese 911, to get Onita to a hospital as soon as possible. Well, with all the commotion going on with this brawl in a fancy hotel, the A&A hotel would end up being furious at Shima for booking the room, and then a man ends up getting kicked in the head and supposedly bleeding everywhere in this fancy ballroom. On top of the fact that the big golden doors that would open up into the room would end up getting damaged during all this chaos of the press conference and Shinma would end up receiving the bill for it. This would upset Shinma so much that Onita would do something like this that he would pull out of FMW right away and be done with Onita forever. The plan was for Shinma to be an advisor for FMW and book the foreign wrestlers as well as the wrestlers training in Lucha Libre. The wrestlers that would have started in FMW had Shinma stayed would have been Ultimo Dragon, Gran Hamada, and Killer Khan who had already been contacted by Shinma about starting with the promotion. Jado Ghetto who didn't work a match and Super Delphin, they had already agreed to work FMW through Shinma so they would stay for the first couple months but as soon as Shinma Shinma and his son would announce that they were going to be starting up their own promotion, a Lucha Libre Japanese promotion called Universal Lucha Libre. They would all get together and decide to leave FNW and join Universal. So that would lead to the first FNW show on October 6, 1989, which was actually half sponsored by Onita, and although most people believe the other half was sponsored by Ayagi, since it was his feud with Onita and this first show was in his hometown in Nagoya, it was actually World Karate Association President Hasaya Maki who sponsored the other half, and although no one professionally filmed this first show and it just exists in handheld form from the crowd, the second FNW show four days later at Corrigan Hall was professionally filmed and Maki's karate promotion owns that footage and for the record it was actually Maki who made the decision to go with Ayagi's karate group when Onita came up to him in June of 89 asking him what karate fighter and what karate group should he start this wrestler versus karate feud with and he picked Ayagi which any other decision that he would have made and we might not have ever seen Mitsuhiro Matsunaga who worked for Ayagi's group at the time ever get into pro wrestling. So this first FNW show concludes with 
Yagi and Onita having another great match, and it's a shame that this was only filmed on handheld because they did a great job here, and the crowd is really into it, with it taking place in a pro wrestling event this time, so... Even though the event was held in Ayagi's hometown of Nagoya, the crowd was still about 70% cheering for Onita here, with Ayagi laying Onita out with some stiff kicks and punches before knocking him down, and Super Delphin, who was in Onita's corner, would end up throwing in the towel to give Ayagi the win here, as once again, both groups would end up rushing into the ring and get into it with one another. Tarzan Goto, and I'll go over all the details about him showing up in another episode, he ended up appearing right as the show started and afterwards he would end up going backstage and smacking the crap out of Super Delphin for throwing the towel in for the Onita loss which the smack would not even get a photograph taken of it so Delphin would end up taking this hard slap for really no reason. And then the second FMW show would again be another success, but this time Onita would get the win over Iyagi as they would embrace for the first time after another great stiff heated match. And despite the success of shows, like I said, they were only co-promoted with Maki. So Maki would end up taking half the earnings and leave Onita with the other half with Onita having to pay the roster for working the shows. Maki would then pull out after these shows thinking that FMW was not a long-term thing for him. So now Onita is going to be fully financially responsible for these FNW shows going forward and Onita wanted the next show to be a barbed wire death match because he had seen the barbed wire while in Puerto Rico in the 80s with the idea that the first two Onita versus Ayagi matches had everyone running in from each side and this barbed wire would prevent that and Onita was actually so poor that he was worried that he was not even going to be able to afford the barbed wire but he managed to get some and the tag match was set up with Onita and and Tarzan Goto taking on Ayagi and his student Mitsuhiro Matsunaga with Ayagi pulling out right before the match due to injury with Jerry Blame and Jerry Flynn taking his spot. And they would end up buying 100% as sharp as you can get barbed wire as Onita would go into it and come away with 25 stitches in his arm because of how deep the cut was. As Onita would do a great job of selling the cut here before getting the win in what would turn out to be the final wrestler versus karate match during this era as the crowd was super into the barbed wire aspect. Then after the December barbed wire match, they would go back to the mixed martial arts format with a tournament at Corrigan in January. And this tournament is all weird as Onita ends up winning the Brass Knuckles title in the second round from Beast the Barbarian. As they act like Beast has been the Brass Knuckles champion going into the show, but they really just gave him the belt and called him the champion for it. And then Onita ends up losing in the semifinals to Tarzan Goto in a non-title match, only for Tarzan Goto to lose to Masanobu Kurosu in the finals while Onita comes out of the show as champion despite getting eliminated in the semifinals of the tournament. And this show is so badly received that people are like, okay, now the shine is officially off FMW. This is where they're going to start to fall apart, like everyone was kind of expecting at the beginning. But Onita recognizes this and decides to take from Antonio Inoki his spiked nail death match back in 1976. And instead does barbed wire boards all around the ring. And after that show does very well and is very well received, it's very apparent that FNW is going to have to be a deathmatch promotion full time and do away with the martial arts aspect if they're going to survive long term. The day before the January tournament at Corrigan Hall happened, though, Yagi would end up getting in touch with Onita and tell him that he wanted a raise from $200 a match to $300. As Yagi had only two matches in FMW total at this point, so he had only made $400 for his two main event matches that helped FMW get started. As Yagi's student, Mitsuhiro Matsunaga, had a deal where he was making $150 a match, and he had worked... 10 shows at this point, so he made about $1,500 in just a couple months. Onita would end up telling Ayagi no to the raise, as Ayagi would end up going to Pioneer Sinshay and get a deal with them for $2,000 a match, and make a deal for Matsunaga to get $1,000 a match, with Ayagi making sure that his student Matsunaga would take that deal and leave with him. Problem with that, though, was that Pioneer Sensei was only running twice a month at this point, and Matsunaga really didn't want to leave FMW. 
So Matsunaga would meet with Onita at a hotel the day after the January Corrigan Hall Martial Arts Tournament show, which he participated in, to confirm to Onita that he was actually leaving FMW, even though he really didn't want to, as he felt Onita was the person that gave him his break and felt like he was betraying Onita and FMW by leaving it. During that meeting, Matsunaga would also see inside Onita's wallet that day and saw that Onita only had $10 in it. So he understood that FMW was not in a position to just be given raises out, as Matsunaga was fine with what he was making. Ayagi would end up telling Matsunaga, though, that FMW wasn't going to make it by the end of the year anyway, so it was best to get out now, as Ayagi shared the opinion that many had about FMW from the beginning. Ironically, though, it would be Pioneer Sensei that would end up closing down within the year as FMW would grow without them. That story is for another episode, though. So that is it for today's episode. Thank you guys so much for listening or watching on YouTube. I'll be back as soon as I can with another episode. In the meantime, if you want a place to check out a bunch of these type of stories, go to my website, bahufnw.com or fnwwrestling.us, where I've been writing about FNW on it for over 23 years at this point, and there are many different stories on there as well if you're interested. And if you'd like to buy any FNW DVDs or MP4s, as well as many different promotions, I have an entire list of everything on my site for sale. And if you want to just listen to these episodes, I'm going to be posting these shows on iTunes, Stitcher, as well as all the other podcast sites on the History of FNW feed. And I'll be posting these shows to my YouTube channel, Brett FNW, where you can just watch them in clip form like I did for History of FNW. So that is it for today, guys. Thank you so much again. Uh, I will see you for episode two. See you then.